Let's get a big round of applause, please, for Jonathan Sharat. Hello, everybody. Uh, yep, son. So I'm the uh, unfortunate last one. So I'm in the way of your party. And, uh, well, sorry about that, but uh, nothing's free in this world. Not even a party. So uh, what are we here to talk about? Well, uh, microservices, just like the last two talks. So you're probably really bored with this by now. So I'll try and make it a, a little bit more interesting. Uh, but uh, as much for you, and actually it's for me, I'm just going to warm up a bit. So the first thing to warm up, well, let's just say something about me. So who am I? Well, uh, I'm Jonathan Sherratt, and uh, I work for ING. And I really like ING, actually. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great employer. So if you don't work there yet, especially you guys over there, then please sign up. It's, uh, it's a good company. They look after you. Uh, I want this. Can I see a raise of hands who saw the uh, SpaceX landing last week? Who saw it? That is going to change this world. There's few things in modern history that really make the jump. The splitting from single cell to multi cell, this is one of those. So keep an eye on that. Uh, I've got two kids, uh, love my kids, and I'm a coder. I've uh, been coding since uh, the same story uh, Commodore. For me, it was Atari XE. Uh, my wife actually let me build that next to the TV in the living room, so uh, I'm a lucky fella. <laughs> So uh, microservices. Well, I put a little bit of theme on this with, uh, with space. So uh, no one will probably recognize this. I did, uh, it did physics in, in Ken. And, um, and this is the Apollo chart. So back in, uh, back in the days when, uh, quite long ago, when we were flying to the moon, and hopefully we're going to go back again, uh, this is how they navigated. So they uh, literally lined it up in their, uh, in their in their windows. Well, things have changed a little bit. So this is the theme. Uh, and why do we care about microservices? Well, it's because we want this, right? We want to be able to just uh, uh, create these services and, and connect them up uh, into Lego pieces. That's, that's pretty cool. We'll be able to move quicker. Uh, they will be interconnected. So that's what we want. Uh, sorry to break this to you guys. But that's, that's bullshit. Uh, you do not program with Lego. Lego is for kids. You know, uh, Lego actually released a programming language. And guess what you do in it? You, uh, you take little Lego bits, and you, uh, you line them up, uh, and you can, you can code in it. That's not how we do programming here. Uh, in actual fact, uh, it's very hard to do coding, as you all know. And here's, uh, here's Mr. Hugh Jackman to prove it for me.
Okay, that's, that's enough of that. So, uh, no, I don't dance like that in my, uh, in my living, living room uh, with, uh, for all my wife and kids to see, because that's not how we code. We don't code by joining blocks together. That's just uh, ridiculous. So why, why do we see this so many times in talks and, uh, and, well, those dreaded architects? Because it's here in the height curve. We're on the way up. Uh, Doc is at the peak, probably going to take a bit of a tumble soon. Uh, and we're not quite there. So uh, microservices is going to get more and more exciting uh, before it gets boring. But what we really want is we want tech like this, uh, Hadoop, where it's gone through the hype, hype curve and it's got boring, which when it gets boring, it gets useful. So uh, what do we really want then? So I'm not here to uh, uh, destroy microservices. In fact, I've done two major projects in it. So uh, clearly, there's something we want. Well, the first thing we want, uh, which is uh, extremely important, is we want our code to be order from chaos. So uh, I actually have a, uh, a, uh, a rack in my kitchen as well. My wife's let me have it for five years, and it's a, it's a noisy bugger. But anyway, it looks more like this one <laughs> rather than that one, because I'm not so good with the cables. Uh, but in our code, if our code looks like this, then uh, it's a big problem, uh, especially if you have a lot of products that are complicated and whatnot. So we, we, need, we need order from the chaos. Uh, the second thing we want is a lot of reuse. We don't want to code uh, servers, HTTP servers. We don't want to code SSL. We don't want to code the internet. We've seen it grow uh, uh, over the years. And it just doesn't make sense. We're uh, just like the talks before. As soon as you start to uh, code something that has been standardized to a heavy level, you introduce vulnerabilities. You're just going to do a rubbish job. So OK, we want, we want order from chaos, and we want quick consumption. So then uh, how do microservices help us do that? Well, uh, they, help, they help us write this. So in a single curl command, I can get my IP address. Now, the magic with this is not, uh, not that it's a small line. The magic with it is curl has got nothing to do with this service. There's uh, no dependencies. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's just using internet protocols. So that's, that's pretty cool. That makes things easy to consume. Uh, it's neat and tidy. But it's not the only way that we can make neat and tidy code. It's not the only way that we can do reuse. Uh, we do it with. Linux shell processes. We do it with uh, compiled libraries, object-oriented. We've been doing this for years. So when you look at microservices, look at them as a tool in your arsenal. They are not the saving. Uh, it's not going to save, uh, I don't know, um, the, the bank. It's just going to be one tool that we deploy. So then, uh, uh, well, just another thing on microservices as well before the definition of it. A microservice is not a HTTP server uh, with REST. It is many things. Now, uh, I've been fortunate enough to run uh, uh, projects back when XML was cool, and it's not cool anymore. Now, all of a sudden, JSON is, and that's not cool anymore, because now we're going to uh, Atomic. So uh, uh, we have to recognize that microservices is just reborn SOA, because as soon as you do that, all those learnings and it's really important in programming that we learn. All those learnings from SOA, we can apply back again. OK. Sounding a bit negative. What are the, uh, what are the positive things about microservices? Well, this is where some of the learnings of ING can really, really help us. One of the biggest problems with any large company, beyond probably two, 300 employees, it's the damn Conway's law. It's always right. Our architecture follows the organizational structure. So actually, the biggest benefit for microservices has got nothing to do with loose coupling, uh, uh, aggregation, uh, code reuse, or need code. It's this. I can take a team that can just work on a payments API, and they don't have uh, the political struggles of another team uh, that are working on something else. So this is the biggest benefit and why when a company gets to a certain size, microservices are a must. 
And it's there for people, not for technology. Okay, uh, by the way, uh, this credit goes to uh, Martin Fowler, not me. So. He also did this. So what else does microservices help us do? Well, it helps us scale. So uh, this is an interesting topic, and we're, I'm going to touch on this a bit more. There's also uh, uh, one of the reasons I chose to uh, study physics rather than a computing degree. So when I got into computing when I was younger, uh, there's a problem when you learn computing. And that's by the time you leave uni, that cool language that you were learning has uh, been replaced by another one. Uh, and that constantly happens. There's one thing that you can't replace, and that's physics. And physics comes into this, and I'll explain more later. But uh, uh, the scaling out. So another massive thing is for scaling out. Okay, let's take a little uh, breather here. So what do I, what do I have up here? Distributed monolith. Has anyone read this article before? No show of hands. Okay, well, uh, when you go away, have a read of this, because there's a really interesting article that says, basically, uh, microservices are still a monolith. It's not that the monolith has gone to microservices, it's just become distributed. If you think about the dependency trees, when you're coding something against a microservice, you still have the dependency on the same fields, uh, on the same interaction patterns, uh, they're all still there, whether it was a, a Java class or whether it was a HTTP server. So it's, uh, it's still a monolith. Okay, it's a little bit modular, but uh, uh, that's what it is. So, okay, if we accept that for a minute, uh, microservices are a monolith, then uh, let's, uh, let's see about that physics we were talking about. Now, I'm sure that we've got much higher hands for this. Who knows CAP theorem? Okay. So uh, if you don't have a read of this, because there's very likely that at least five or six people in this room are coding something that is bound by cap theorem and they don't even realize it. And then they get really excited when they get to the end, oh, I've coded some uh, really efficient caching layer. And uh, yeah, you, you have, but you've, uh, you're not solving something new. Uh, sorry to break it to you, but uh, uh, this has been studied. This is a law. This is governed by physics. This is not governed by technology. All right, well, what about the two generals paradox? Who, know, who knows about this one? Okay, anyone worked on a database then? Raise your hands if you work on databases. Uh, traditional, nope. Well, uh, it just so happens that database transactions are exactly governed by this. Uh, another one that you definitely use today is TCP. So that TCP protocol, probably one of the most successful pro protocols ever made, is completely designed around this. Those ACs and NACs, they're trying to solve this problem. So I'm not, I don't have time to go into it, but uh, please go and read about, just Google, Google will teach you, two generals paradox. This one, I'm sure you know, Moore's Law. So uh, we've been uh, pretty good at this, actually. He's, uh, in fact, the entire, if you look at Intel, you can see that a lot of their uh, organizational structure, a lot of their uh, internals are actually built to make this prophecy continue. Uh, I, I, I have a theory that the main reason for that uh, is for marketing. If they can uh, keep this theory going longer, then it keeps them relevant. Uh, so uh, we're on track to keep doing Moore's Law. Nope, that's where we're wrong again. So, Google this one by uh, a fellow called Joel uh, Kroska. I think I said his name right. Uh, no, Moore's Law died. Moore's Law actually died in 2005. What happened in 2005? We couldn't make the clock speed go any faster on CPUs. We kept shrinking those transistors smaller and smaller but we couldn't get the clock speed. Then you've got some other metrics here which he's, which he's analyzed, which is the power. We can't get any more power in the chips. Uh, so, okay, this is uh, a little confusing. Uh, why are we saying Moore's Law is continuing in Intel, and yet we're also saying, on the other hand, Moore's Law is dead? Well, the clue is in the title. Moore's Law is dead, long live Moore's Law. 
And it's also the reason that microservices is used for scaling. What happened in 2005 is we created multi-core processes. And then multi-threading became much, much, much more important. And then if you look at what microservices is doing for the scaling side, it's just another form of multi-threading. It's just multi-threading across different physical machines. Interesting. So then uh, let's have a look at that multi-core architecture. So here we go. Uh, they get these by x-raying them. It's pretty cool. They can, uh, they can do espionage quite easily with, uh, with the chips. So this is uh, quite an old one, actually. It's, it's an Intel one. We're much smaller than 16 millimeters now. And it's, uh, it's four cores. And you'll see, uh, you'll see that the, the data is stored in this cache. And uh, there's uh, quite a cool history about this. Um, but we're up to layer three caches here. Now the distance, the physical distance from one end of this chip to the other end of the chip is 16 millimeters. That's pretty damn small. Now why is that relevant? Why is that important? Because that dictates the amount of time it takes for transactions to get from one end to the other. Now, there's a problem with multi-threaded programming. The problem with multi-threaded programming is not everything can be made multi-threaded. In fact, a lot of things can't. When you write down those business rules, x plus y, well, x has to add to y. There's a serial nature to that. Uh, and if you expand that out to more and more complex business rules, you'll see that actually most, uh, most processes cannot be parallelized. Sure, we can do multiple transactions in parallel for different customers, but we can't, when we kick off a transaction, then spawn it out to lots of threads and back in again. It's just too inefficient. So then there's, a, there's a metric here that's really, really important, which is the number of serial TPS. The difference between serial TPS and normal TPS is these are all lined up in a row. Now, this has been optimized for many, many, many years. So they've got it pretty fast, 20 billion per second in a row. If you put a loop with no access to memory or disk, it will iterate pretty damn fast, 20 billion times. So that's, that's, that's pretty cool. So uh, we've got quite a bit of power here, uh, but that's not enough we hit the end of Moore's law. Our algorithms have got more complicated. Uh, OK. So, uh, so what did we do? Well, um, oh, hang on. Ah, there's a bit more on here. I need to <laughs> touch on these ones. So uh, th then we uh, bolt on RAM. So RAM is uh, a bit more distant. RAM is uh, stored separately from CPUs in these, uh, in these cool sticks. Uh, now, the distance there is about 20 centimeters. Now, if you're keen eye on, uh, on the technology for the things that you're programming, then you're, uh, you'll be pretty interested in what they're doing with memory. The next thing they're doing with memory is they're taking it and they're sticking it on top of the chips. So why do they do that? Because this distance. This distance here represents 0 0.5 nanoseconds. That means you can now only get 2 billion TPS. OK, that's not so bad. Uh, so RAM's, uh, RAM's pretty good. Uh, now, we have this, uh, this annoying thing called persistence, uh, which is why we need SSDs and, uh, and spinning disks. Now, they're uh, really terrible, <laughs> especially the spinning disk. It's amazing a computer even booted up with this thing. Uh, four milliseconds, 250 serial TPS. That's horrific. If you were to uh, put ING's uh, payment engine on that, it would be uh, practically unusable, which is why Linux created this. So uh, uh, I'd done a bit of uh, Linux kernel programming in my time, so I played with these, uh, these classes. And um, uh, it's actually very, very, very good. Uh, there was an estimate I saw uh, not so long ago that the cost to rewrite Linux from scratch uh, was something like $2 billion. That's how much effort has gone into optimizing this thing. Now, this makes hard drives fast. If we didn't have this, the hard drives would uh, uh, would be 250 serial TPS, which is, it, which is no good for us. OK, so let's zoom out a bit more. Let's go to uh, racks. So I only have a rack in my 
kitchen is about that big, but in, in data centers there are 42 IUs and they're normally uh, uh, stacked next to each other. Uh, and this is where we get to network protocols. And this is really where uh, microservices start to live. Uh, now in, in this world, we only get 2,000 serial TPS. Okay, that's not so bad. We can do quite a lot with that still. So maybe we can do, uh, I don't know, 100 uh, microservice calls if it's, uh, if it's all in this vicinity. Good. Okay, then we go out. Now the problem is we've gone out a little bit further because we have to keep our data highly available. And there's some, uh, some uh, frustrating laws, which make sense, uh, about the distance that they have to be from each other. Um, here, 200 kilometers means we have a serial TPS of only 200. Oh, why, why is this a problem? This is a problem because if I have a microservice here, and I do 20 calls, and they're over on this data center, then my latency goes up and up and up and up and up. So if you create entity microservices, and you decide to distribute them across two data centers, forget about it. Your performance is going to drop through, through the bottom, and you're, not going to, uh, you're just not going to meet your, your, your needs. So that means we have to be very careful with data locality. And with data locality, what we try to do is make sure that your microservices stay in the same kind of uh, area, uh, which is uh, over here. Cool. Well, let's go a bit further out. Well, it's a bit of a space theme here. So what happens if we colonize Mars like Mr. Elon wants us to do? Uh, what's that distance? Well, that distance is anywhere between 56 to 250 million kilometers, of which you can get a serial TPS of much less than one. So uh, it just gives you, by going to extremes, it really helps us design uh, our services, our, our software, uh, with their limitations in mind. Now, this is something there is no technology on the planet that will fix, uh, because it's limited by physics. And this is why it's a distributed monolith, too, because uh, the dependencies are there. The dependencies are there, whether we like it or not, uh, but it's distributed. So this architecture has allowed us to exceed the limits of when Moore's law got stuck on the CPUs, and it's allowed us to scale out. But we've got to be careful with that. Uh, we've got to be very careful with that. Which is why we do this. So if there's anything that you remember from my talk, please remember this triangle. Uh, what this triangle is saying, that you start with one TPS. And that could be someone clicking pay somebody else on a banking website. That's somewhere on the planet. Now, it could be in, uh, I don't know, Australia or Romani Romania, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, but you, you don't want to uh, go more than one. You need to get that transaction into a building. That means get it into a data center somewhere. Uh, it should not leave that building, though. It should stay in that building. It should then go to a server. As you're going down this triangle, you have the liberty of increasing the number of serial TPS. So that means you can go more and more uh, uh, chatty. So if you think about a, uh, if you think about building a microservice, an entity service or something on a on a particular data entity, think about very carefully where you're going to put this. Are you going to put it in the same building? Are you going to put it in the same server? Are you going to put it on the same die? It's almost entirely driven by the number of serial TPS you do. So I want to something a little bit more different, which is distributed computing and distributed monoliths are really hard. Uh, those problems that I talked about, uh, two generals, Cap's theorem, uh, they have been studied to death, and certain things have been optimized to death to get them right. One of them is TCP. So please, whatever you do, do not rewrite TCP. Do not rewrite DNS. Do not rewrite IP. Do not rewrite load balances. They've been optimized to make your life easy, and they take all this, all this into account. So uh, I think it was Netf 
Netflix or, or Spotify, I can't remember which one, but they, uh, they advertise that we need to invest in boring technology. So this is, this is rewriting this is actually a lot of fun. I rewrote, uh, tried to turn UDP into TCP. Uh, it was lots of fun, uh, but uh, I would never use it in my job and they'd probably fire me if I did. So uh, reuse as much as you can. Now the best way to uh, filter this and is to tell you, okay, am I crossing into that dangerous barrier or not, is the client. Now remember earlier, I showed you that curl statement. It says, curl, get my IP address. If you put any code in curl, then you screwed this up. So if you are writing a, a, a Java library that you have to hand off to, uh, to a client, in order for them to consume your microservice, you screwed this up. That's the warning sign. It means you need to go back and think, okay, what protocols am I rewriting? What should I reuse instead? Because distributed computing is hard. Okay, the next one is, uh, and it, this was uh, touched in the last presentation a bit with the aggregation, um, uh, with aggregation services. So in terms of performance, Aggregation services help us with that triangle. So if you aggregate things, and you make sure the thing that you're aggregating is very close to you, in the same server, in the same building, on the same planet, then you'll get much better performance. So uh, we called it many different things in, in, uh, over the last 20 years. They used to, back in the SOA days, they were called entity services. Uh, now they're called experience APIs or uh, uh, another project I did, we called them business services. Uh, now they're getting called aggregation and projection services, but they're all really the same thing. Taking smaller services, wrapping them up in more coarse-grained services, and making them available to the consumers. This is one of the best ways of solving that triangle. So uh, I went much quicker. Uh, than um, I planned, but that's because you, you guys want to um, go to the party. So I, I'll finish up with the uh, conclusion and I'll take some questions. So the conclusion that I want you to take away is microservices are not Lego. They're not building blocks that you can just stick together. It's the same thing. You're still programming something, whether you split it up or put it together. So uh, treat it the same. Beware of the hype curve. Uh, these technologies are valuable. Uh, Docker is very valuable. Uh, uh, Microservice is very valuable. Hadoop is very valuable. But uh, there are inflated expectations. So use the tools that you have. There are other tools to your disposal, not just microservices. There are uh, in the classes. Your coders, you know what they are. Third one I want you to remember is that Microservices are not the successor to the monolith. They still are the monolith. It's just been distributed. So uh, keep that in mind when you're, when you're coding things. Uh, they do make coding easier, but the main reason they make coding easier is because of humans, not because of the technology. If, if uh, in ING we were able to organize ourselves around class namespaces and say, hey, you can't touch my classes, and you you, yeah, you can touch yours, we would achieve a similar thing, but we don't do that. We don't do that for whatever reason. Um, but uh, that's what they really, uh, really help us with there, and that's why I will continue to encourage people to do microservices, especially in big companies, because this, this, uh, this benefit really does help us. Uh, so don't go too granular too early. If you go too granular with your microservices, physics will get you, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Service layering helps you solve this chatty problem and uh, never touch the client. The client is sacred. Uh, that's it. So um, thank you very much. All righty. Do we have any questions for Jonathan? Not one. You don't. You don't have to. It is. It is a choice. 
You're choosing no. Okay, then let's have one more big round of applause for Jonathan, please. Thanks, mate. So, um, we've come to the end of the day. As I've been talking about all day, we're going to give someone a thousand euros, which should be fairly exciting. But before we do that, we've got to sort out some stuff. Now, who has been playing the puzzle quiz room game? So where were you at lunchtime when I asked? Oh, you just decided you would be brave now. Okay, I get it. Okay, whether you've been playing and trying to solve the puzzles or not, now would be a very good time to download a QR code reader because we're going to run a challenge in a minute that could make the difference between whether you win it or lose it. Everyone knows what a QR... Does anyone not know what a QR code reader is? Okay. So what I'm assuming is that we're about to kill the Wi-Fi but everyone download one of those now and install it, and then I'm going to explain why. Now, because I need to kill some time, and because you all seem to be addicted to t-shirts, we're going to have some more t-shirts. Sorry, sir. So, who wants a t-shirt? Yes, there. Very good. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna, I'm, I've got more energy now, so you can sit down. I'm going to throw them. That's, it's not ambitious enough. I want to get, that's good. That's what I'm talking about. What, see, there are some gentlemen still alive in the world. Let's try this one. That, that was just shit. Okay, anyone else? Yes, you, sir, in the back. Got, got you. Sorry, it's actually your head. My bad. Oh, wait, I forgot. I also have stickers. Who wants a sticker? These ones are fun because I'm just going to throw them in two batches. Is it going to go this way or this way? It's going to go this way. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen now. Watch, watch your eyes. Yeah, okay, good. I'm going to go this way. Now you've got stickers. T-shirts. That's what I thought. No one likes stickers. Everyone likes T-shirts. Very good. Now what I'm waiting for is for a massive check to appear with a thousand euros written on it. There you go, mate. Anyone else? You? Okay. See if we can do this. Very good. One down the front. Last t-shirt. I think I'm going to have to see some more enthusiasm. I mean, it's the last one. Okay, it's, it's between these two guys. You're going to have to fight it out now. Make some noise. I can't. He's winning. I'm sorry, man. He's winning. <laughs> nice. Nice. But I appreciate the effort. Now, um, there are actually T-shirts over there and over there that you can just go and grab from DCOS, which require a lot less screaming, but I thought it was funnier to do it this way. So we're going to do it this way. Okay, where's the big, huge check with a thousand euros on it? It's in the back over there. Very good. Right. Do you have a microphone? Yeah. Cool. So, did you all download a QR code scanner thing? Did anyone not download a QR code scanner app? Are you all just ignoring me now because I'm not giving you t-shirts? <laughs> Fuckers. All right, here's the way it's going. Oh, I see what happened. <laughs> okay, we're going to let that calm down for a minute. I've never seen people who love t-shirts this much. It's really amazing. We can send more. It's okay. You're all going to have t-shirts. Okay, if you're getting a t-shirt, I want you to calm down and then sit down. 30 seconds, because this, this is the big finale. 
Okay, everyone's, everyone's got a t-shirt, hugging the t-shirt. Right, now, remember the guy behind the scenes running all the quizzes and stuff, this guy. He's gonna explain what's gonna happen now. Can we get a big round of applause for him, please? Thank you. Um, so I've prepared a final puzzle for you guys, um, and I'm sure you are really excited to see who is going to be the winner this night. Um, but I'm not going to make it easy for you to just show the winners to you. Um, I've created the QR code, a big QR code, and I'll show it on the screen. It's pretty big, but as you can see, we have to fill in some boxes. So we're going to crowdsource this QR code together with each other, and everyone is going to be we are going to be divided in two teams. Developers and operations. As you all know, developers need operations and operations need developers to finally get to a product. It's the same with this. Every square has to be a, be a match between a developer and an operator working together to create this QR code. You've all been assigned ro roles uh, already. It's going to be in your app in a few seconds. And um, you have to create matches. So as a developer, you have to find operator, and as an operator, you have to be, find a developer to create a match and make a part of this. If you do so successfully, you get some points, around uh, 35 points, and the person who scans this QR code the first, the fastest, gets 200 extra points. So it's gonna be really exciting uh, to see who is going to scan it and to see what it does with the end score. Okay, so let's give, them, let's give them a concrete example. You've got the app. Are you ops or dev? It's not on there yet. It's not on there yet. Forget the concrete example. <laughs> when is it coming on? Uh, well, when we want to, so maybe we can uh, give a countdown and then we can start. Should we do a countdown from 10? Wait a minute. Oh. We seem to be having technical issues. Oh. Okay, it seems we have a choice. This, the talk upstairs hasn't finished yet, so we can either not wait for them and take the money for ourselves. I'm starting to get an idea of Romania now. We're gonna wait for them, okay? In the meantime, I'm going to see if I can throw around some more t-shirts. Just give us five minutes. <laughs> 